Now that brings us to chapter 3, and we've been looking at some very interesting subjects. Remember back in 1, it was heathen customs judged. And here in chapter 2, it was heathen philosophy judged. And now we come to heathen pride is judged in chapter 3. And I've given the subject of this chapter, the decree of Nebuchadnezzar, to enforce universal idolatry. And the three Hebrew children are cast into the furnace when they refuse to bow to the image of gold. Now, I'd like to read here the first section we have in verses 1 and 2, the construction of the image of gold by Nebuchadnezzar to institute a universal religion. I'm reading now, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was threescore cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. Verse 2, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now you'll notice we're told it's an image of gold, and it reveals the lavish display of of wealth and workmanship, which went into the construction of this impressive image. Now, some scholars think that Nebuchadnezzar constructed this image in memory of his father, Nabopolassar. Others are equally convinced that he made it to Baal. That was the pagan god of Babylon. But actually, it's more likely that he made it of himself, as Daniel had declared that he was represented as the head of gold in the dream image. Now, instead of humbling himself before God, why, the dream had caused him now to be filled with excessive pride. And he made an entire image of gold to represent the kingdom he'd built, the head of gold, you see. Now, it's 60 cubits high, and it's 6 cubits in breadth. And that, my friend, was a pretty good size image. Now, if a cubit is 18 inches, and it was certainly in that neighborhood, this image was 90 feet high. Now, that's very high. And Babylon was situated on a plain, flat country. It was a city of skyscrapers in that day. And the height of the image made it visible to great multitudes for the plain of Jura was sort of like an airport of that day. It was flat and expansive, and it enabled a great multitude to assemble for the worship of the king. And so for the dedication of the image, all the leaders and government officials were present. In other words, the brass was there at first, and they were to sell this project to the people. This was the first step in the brainwashing program. These bureaucrats comprised... A great company, by the way. Now, let's look at this for a moment. What was it Nebuchadnezzar really had in mind here? Well, it shows, number one, the rebellion of Nebuchadnezzar against the God of heaven who had given him world dominion. Instead of being grateful, this is a definite attempt of rebelling against him. Then there's another thing, the second. It shows, likewise, his vaunted pride in making an image which evidently was self-deification. The Roman emperors attempted that later on. And then there's a third reason here. Obviously, he was seeking a unifying principle to weld together the tribes and tongues and peoples of his kingdom in a great totalitarian government. That was the thing that he had. In other words, he's picking a world religion. And this was nothing in the world but a repetition of the Tower of Babel, informing one religion for the world. By the way, does that sound like anything you hear about today? They're working on it today. Unfortunately, there are a great many people that are staying in denominations connected with the World Council of Churches. My friend... 
They're moving to a world religion today, and you want to know something? They're going to leave Jesus out altogether. Now, all of these attempts, therefore, are made not to worship the living and true God, but actually to oppose him. And these modern movements today all go in the same direction. What it's going to lead to is to the great tribulation period, to the man of sin, the false prophet, after the church is removed from the earth, the true church, those that are in the body of believers. And don't think that I'm left out. A great many people today have formed little cliques as if they are the ones. I want to say to you, every believer in Christ, I don't care who he is. I don't care about the color of his skin, the name of his denomination. If he's trusted Christ, we're all going to go out together. Now, will you notice, I think this chapter is historic in its content, and seemingly it's just out of place here. But there is an adumbration of the period here, the Great Tribulation. The things that happen here are prophetic picture of coming events during the Great Tribulation. Nebuchadnezzar represents the beast out of the sea, the Antichrist. The fiery furnace that he's going to put these Hebrew children in is the suffering of the Great Tribulation. The image represents the abomination of desolation that the Lord Jesus mentions. And the three Hebrew children represent the remnant which will be miraculously preserved during this period. But do you notice that Daniel is absent He wasn't put in the fire furnace. He's not even mentioned in this chapter. Where was he? Well, we were told that he was made ruler over Babylon. I think he's out somewhere in the end of that kingdom on state business. He was out, you know, maybe representing Nebuchadnezzar before some of the rulers, petty rulers out there. And may I say, his very absence is interesting. Daniel represents the church which is removed from the scene of the Great Tribulation. May I say to you, the events in this chapter, though historic, they have prophetic significance, and it makes it extremely interesting to look at. Now I want to begin reading here at verse 3, for this is the dedication. Then the princes, the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You see, now the day of dedication had arrived, and all were present, though Daniel was absent. And we believe there's a good legitimate reason. He was away on state business. He's now actually a man in a unique position of being the chief advisor of the emperor of Babylon, the man that's the world ruler now, the king of Babylon. And so at this dedication, the sight of this image of gold on the plain of Jura was very impressive. And it was as impressive, by the way, as an Atlas missile on a launching pad down in Florida. And it made a tremendous appeal to the eye. And now I'm reading at verse 4 now of chapter 3. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Now, this is the dedication service, and we talk today about freedom of worship. They knew nothing about it then at the particular time when the orchestra is playing, and they had there, if you'll notice, this orchestra, and I'll say a word about it. And the fact of the matter is there's no room here for spontaneous and personal religion. This is something that's all prearranged. 
and everybody's to go down on their face the minute that the orchestra sounds out. And if you'll notice the different instruments they had, they had the sound of the cornet, that's a woodwind instrument, and a flute, that's a wind instrument, and a harp was a stringed instrument, and a sackbut was a trombone or a high-stringed instrument. It's difficult to tell. Psaltery was a stringed instrument like the harp, and the dulcimer was a drum with strings above and played with a stick. And then it says all kinds of music. And that indicates that all of the instruments and types of music are not really listed here, and that probably there was more in the orchestra. Well, I've given this orchestra a name. It's called the Babylonian Beboppers, or the Babylonian Beatles, or the Royal Rock Quartet Plus Two, or how many more instruments there was there. You can add to it just as much as you want to. And maybe we should call it the Chaldean Philharmonic Orchestra. I don't know. But be that as it may, this was more than a dedication. People were forced to worship. Although true worship is an expression of the heart, it cannot be forced. They went through the outward form. The appeal of the music was to the flesh. You see, music that's spiritual is a wonderful aid to worship. And believe me, in our churches today, that is in many of them, it's very difficult to tell the difference between spiritual music and worldly music. And Paul has a great deal to say about the importance of music for the believer in worship. He says in Ephesians 5:19, and by the way, this was for spirit-filled believers because after he gave the instruction, be filled with the Spirit, he says, now speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And in Colossians 3.16, he says, "...let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord." But you see, at the very beginning, music got off to a bad start. It was mentioned first in the godless line of Cain. And way back in Genesis 4.21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handled a harp and organ. That is in the genealogy of Cain. You see, when music or ritual appeals to the flesh, it degrades man rather than elevates him, and it's not an aid to true worship. Now, I've been... A pastor for a long time. I have had music that might lifted the service. It helped the minister, and it was spiritual, and it was a great blessing. But I have also been in a service when you have music that absolutely nullifies the spiritual worship. It cancels it out. It deadens everything. I remember quite a few years ago, holding meetings back east in a certain place. And it was a very fine church, and right before I was to give the first message, well, they called on a young lady to sing. Well, I'd never have seen such a showman as that girl was. And she didn't have much to show, by the way, as far as music was concerned. She couldn't sing too well. And she picked a song that had nothing to do, really, with worship, but gave her an opportunity to show off her voice, which, again, as I say, wasn't too much. And I never had such a deadening beginning of anything, so much so that after I said a few words of introduction, realizing how dead it was, I suggested we sing another hymn. And we did, and that helped out a little. I suppose the people thought, my, this preacher that's coming here to preach, he certainly doesn't have very much to say or much for us. Well, I must confess that I might have been guilty, but the fact of the matter is, it's too bad that that girl was used to sing. 
I asked the preacher about it. In fact, he apologized to me about it, and he made it very clear that she was the daughter of one of his leading officers and that it was customary in that church to always let her open any new meeting by singing. And I've often thought since then, I wonder how many meetings that poor girl wrecked. May I say to you, music can be helpful or not. And the world of music has a tremendous influence on people today. And it's gotten into many services in our churches. Thank God there are many ministers standing against it today. Now, the thing here is that there's to be a terrible penalty if anyone here refused to worship. And this music, I'm sure, that helped to prepare them for worldly worship. And the fact of the matter is, you can be sure of one thing, that everybody in that crowd went down on their faces with the exception of three young men. Now, let me continue to read at verse 7. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sackbut, psalter, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshiped a golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, this movement of dedication was an act of worship, and it was practically unanimous. There may have been many who were not convinced in their hearts, but they gave no visible evidence that they were contrary. They attempted to justify their positions, I'm sure, of compromise by some form of rationalizing. That's generally the way the people do today. Man was telling me that the reason that he continued in the church that he did, it's a liberal church, he's supposed to be sound. He said that his father had been a leader in that church and that his father had been an outstanding layman. When he died, they had a stained glass window there dedicated to his father. He felt like he couldn't leave the church. Well, anybody uses that kind of an excuse, that's rationalizing. And I would say that if it came down to a stained glass window, I'd tell him that I'd put him in another one and I'd take that one out, take it with me wherever I went. Because, friends, that's actually a very unfortunate reason. Now, will you notice that we come now to the accusation against the three Hebrew children for failure to worship the image. Now, there were three men there that apparently didn't bow. Verse 8, Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Now, the king apparently had appointed observers to note any irregularities in the service. And the designated certain Chaldeans may indicate that they had been watching here these three. And they may have been jealous, or they may have had some personal animosity toward them. The only Jews who were involved, of course, were the three Hebrew children, because they were among the officers of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Jews in captivity who had not any position of leadership, of course, they were not present at this meeting at all. Now, will you notice, and I'm reading now, verses 9 through 12. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Let me pause right there a minute. This is the third time we've been given a list of this orchestra. It must have been a very famous orchestra in that day. And that's the reason I call them the Babylonian Beatles. They were there playing this, you know, rock music, getting people ready for the worship of this image. And now they're mentioned to us again. Now we're told here, And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fire furnace. There are certain Jews, whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, 
have not regarded thee, they serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You see, their accusation before the king was very formal and according to protocol. They made a direct charge against the three Hebrew children by name. There's no misunderstanding as to whom they meant. Now, their charge was accurate. Their insinuation, these men, O king, have not regarded thee, that was absolutely false. Their refusal was not an act of disloyalty to the king personally. It was a recognition of a higher power. They were obedient to their God as is revealed by their answer. Now, notice verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Notice what it says about Nebuchadnezzar, his rage and fury. Now, this man had a problem, and a real psychological problem, and we'll pick that up in the next chapter. But I call attention to this. It characterizes his form of insanity. He suffered from as we shall see, hysteria. And it's a sort of a manic, depressive psychosis. One moment they're hot with anger, and the next minute, why, they're laughing their head off. Now we have here the declaration by the three Hebrew children of the power of their God in refusal to worship the image. And I'm going to read now verses 14 And 15, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, It is true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? You see, Nebuchadnezzar asked them if the charge is true. Have they refused to worship his gods and the image which he set up? Verse 15, Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalter, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music. Here we go again. That was sure some famous orchestra. Ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now he gives them another opportunity to change their mind and fall down before the image. You see, their submission now would be a worse reproach than it would have been at the outset. He recites again the penalty for refusal, and he shows the fallacy of it. Now, the king has heard of their God before, and he assures them that he's unable to deliver them. Now, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Here we start out again with that expression. The thought here is, O king, live forever. But they left off that. And they said, we are not careful. means that they have carefully weighed the consequences for refusing to obey the king. They've counted the costs, and they're not being careful in giving an answer about it. They uh, very carefully considered the cause. Now, the wise men in Babylon would have advised them to fall down and worship. But God had told them, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, and etc., etc., so that These Hebrew children were being true to God, and it took a great deal of courage for them to take this position. And now they're told, verse 17, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Now, if it's God's will, they make it very clear why he'll deliver us out of your hand. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now, we see the reaction to all of this by 
this man Nebuchadnezzar, and this actually gives us preparation for the next chapter because we're going to find a man here on the throne that is quite abnormal. He is suffering from a form of insanity. Now, let me read verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spoke and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. You can see the extreme that he goes to. He's full of rage. And this reveals that he had an uncontrollable temper. And also that this man was subject to these extreme outrages, this extreme emotionalism. And he turns against these men whom he had previously favored. In other words, he goes from one extreme to another. And now he goes to the extreme and venting his anger against them. And the fire was to be built up seven times larger and hotter than usual. And that was not necessary, but it reveals the thing that was in this man's heart. He goes from one extreme to another. And now I read verse 21. Then these men were bound in their coats. And here it says their hosen. Well, their hosen happens to be their socks. Or let's be a little more polite and say their stockings and their turbans, their hats, and their other garments. In other words, they are put in full dress for this trip to the fiery furnace. And they were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Will you notice here, the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire, slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I imagine that the fire being as large and as hot as it was, these men got too close. And when they went to throw these three men in, they went in with them. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Now, these three were dispatched immediately. You see, the haste and high temperature caused those who threw in the captives to likewise perish in the flame. But notice what happens now. And I'm reading verses 24 and 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, I want to change that just a little here. The last expression should be the fourth one was like, a son of the gods. And I think that is truer to the literal, because this man Nebuchadnezzar actually had no knowledge of the living and true God at this time, although Daniel has already introduced him to that. But certainly he didn't have any knowledge to be able to identify who it was there. Now, I believe the one that was there was the Son of God, the pre-incarnate Christ. But now we'll notice this. This furnace apparently was an open furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar fully expected these men to expire at once. And he was amazed to see them alive and walking about in the fire. Another amazing sight was to see a four, whom Nebuchadnezzar described in the form as a son of the God. Now, I believe that the fourth one, as we've indicated, was the Son of God, the pre-incarnate Christ. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, not having spiritual perception, he could only testify to his unusual appearance. He looked like one of the sons of the gods. And the preservation of these faithful few 
in the fiery furnace is miraculous. Now, let's nail this down here. There is no other explanation. You either accept it or reject it entirely. Either the book of Daniel is misrepresenting or it's telling the truth. We have today a group that many of them have been identified as the neo-Orthodox. They rob the language of its true meaning. They castrate the meaning and the language of Scripture. They say it doesn't mean what it says. It means something else that's spiritual. Now, to me, that type of rationalism is not only hypocritical, but it is absolutely deceptive and it's deceiving And it's generally done with malice and forethought. I remember several years ago in Pasadena, a retired preacher of a certain denomination, he attended the church I served in Pasadena, and he and I became very friendly. And he told me about visiting one of the outstanding churches in Southern California of his denomination. And the reason he visited, he told me, was that the pastor there was the son of a friend of his, and that the man who was pastor, he said, as a boy, I'd held him on my knee. He says, I went to hear him preach. And he said, you know, I heard him using language that I was accustomed to hear. And I went up to him afterward, and I congratulated him, and I said to him, Why, you are using language, the same language that John Wesley used. And this man made this statement. He says, I use the same language that John Wesley used, but I don't mean what John Wesley meant by it. You see, positively deceptive. Taking language and trying to explain away its real meaning. And the reason that I'm bearing down at this point, there are many of the miracles of Scripture that they have attempted to explain away. For instance, Jesus didn't walk on the water. He walked on the shore, and they thought he was walking on the water. And the other miracles that they attempt to explain away, that this widow's son was not really dead. They thought he was. Jesus just waked him up. That was all. That type of double talk. And that type of double talk is not only deceptive, it's certainly hypocritical. Now, you either believe this miracle or you don't believe it. No three men can be thrown into a fiery furnace without being absolutely destroyed unless a miracle takes place. So you either believe this or you don't believe it. I believe it, my friend. And not only that, but... There's a fourth man appears there. And I believe that that fourth man was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here is something I'd like to emphasize at this particular time. I mentioned it when we began this chapter here. And that is that this is a historical incident, but it is a picture of the Great Tribulation period. That fiery furnace represents the suffering of the great tribulation period. And this man, Nebuchadnezzar, he represents that beast out of the sea, the Antichrist, the last great world ruler. And this image represents the abomination of desolation. And these three Hebrew children represent the remnant which will be miraculously preserved during this period. And then, it's quite interesting, Daniel is not in this chapter at all. Where was Daniel? Well, he wasn't around. He apparently, since he holds an office, not only as the Supreme Court Justice, but Prime Minister of the Kingdom, he's out on the kingdom business, and he's out on the king's highway somewhere, and he's not there. But he's a picture of the redeemed that are to be removed before the great tribulation period, and that, of course, is the church. You have a very wonderful picture, I think, presented here. Now, in that fourth man, 
you have something that's quite wonderful for all of us. And that is that the Lord Jesus was there with them. And he'll be with them in that day, those that are his, when they go through the trial. And friends, he's with you and me today. When we go through trials down here, he said when he was here, John 16, 33, these things I've spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, that is trouble. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And the Lord Jesus said, I'm going to be with you. Lo, I'm with you always. And he promises never to leave nor forsake his own. What a picture we have here. Now I'm reading verses 26 and 27. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, neither was their coats chained, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. They didn't even smell like they were bought at a fire sale. There are going to be some Christians in heaven like that, but these men were not. In other words, now Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges that these three are the servants of the Most High God. I think he's getting a little closer to a knowledge of God. And they came forth, not a hair singed, nor the smell of smoke on the garments. This, my friend, is a clear-cut miracle. You either believe it or you don't believe it. Don't tell me today that you believe in the Word of God and that you today are a Christian who trusts the Lord. My friend, what about this miracle here? May I say, you either believe it or you don't believe it. Now we come to the last division of this chapter, and we have here the conviction of Nebuchadnezzar. And you have the decree concerning the God of the Hebrew children and the promotion of these three Hebrew children. They are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or their real names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I'm reading now verse 28 of chapter 3. Then Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. The houses shall be made a dunghill, because there's no other god that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now, there is nothing personal in this expression of Nebuchadnezzar's, yet he recognizes the omnipotence of the living God and his power in delivering these three. He grants that their God is superior to his. This is the conviction of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, in the next chapter, we're going to hear his personal testimony of conversion, I believe. He came to a knowledge of the living and true God. You see, it took this man a long time moving out of paganism and heathenism. And that's the process that a great many go through today. That's one of the things we are discovering in this Through the Bible program. We have any number of letters from people who listened six months before they got saved. And I've read several letters where it begins by someone saying that when they first started listening to me, they thought I was off my rocker. One college student, he said that 
He thought that he was mentally superior and I must be mentally inferior. And that, of course, could be true. But the thing is, this young fellow finally waked up one day, having listened several months, that he was the one playing the fool and that he needed to turn to the Savior. And it took this man, Nebuchadnezzar, a long time to break out of the web of all of the paganism and idolatry in which he was saturated. But you can see he's moving in that direction. Now, these three Hebrew children, as you can see, are back in Nebuchadnezzar's favor. Twice now they've had the sentence of death upon them. Twice they've been delivered miraculously. And twice they've been promoted. You know, the Lord Jesus is able to keep his own in the world today. That ought to be a comforting thought to many of us. You remember he said in John 10, 27, 28, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And then in John 17, verse 11, And now I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And then John 17, 15, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil one. Then Hebrews 7:25. Wherefore, he's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And then in 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Friends, you and I are living in a world today in which we're going to have trouble. And some of God's children do get in a fiery furnace. But he's able to keep you there, and he's able to bring you out of it. Now, we have here in this chapter the dream of Nebuchadnezzar about a great tree hewn down to a stump. And that was fulfilled in the subsequent period of the king's madness. In this chapter, we're going to get a great deal of information that we haven't had before about this man, Nebuchadnezzar. And actually, there was a skeleton in the closet, something I'm sure that they didn't boast of. I'm confident of that. It was the form of insanity that Nebuchadnezzar had. We are coming now to that. And actually, this is just a leaf, as it were, that's taken from the archives of Babylon. And it opens here with the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar, because the first four verses here contain the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar, and it really should come at the end of the chapter because this testimony grew out of the experience this man had here in the fourth chapter. Then you have this tree dream of Nebuchadnezzar. That's from verses 4 through 18. And then the tree dream interpreted by Daniel, verses 19 to 27. And then the tragic fulfillment in the mental malady of Nebuchadnezzar, verses 28 through 33. And then we have the time of the dream fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar's reason fully restored. And that is verses 34 and 37. Now, this man suffered from a form of insanity that I think is pretty well cataloged today and a great deal is known about it. And as we are going to suggest a great many of the world rulers have suffered from this. We're living in a day when a great deal of attention is given to mental illness and to forms of abnormality. And we're living in a day when there's a great deal of it, apparently. wonder sometimes who is normal in this mad world in which we live. 
And if you go to the psychologist, you will find out that he draws a little chart. And he puts a line down, and then he begins to draw above that line, just a little above it, then he goes higher and higher, and then he comes back down. And the bulk of mankind is in this section here where it's higher, and that's called normal. And that that was at the beginning, that is abnormal or below normal, and the other at the other end are above normal. They are where the geniuses are today. Now, that, of course, is arbitrary. Now, who's going to really say today who is sane and who is not sane? The standard is the way all of us act. And when you get the majority, that's called normality. When it's just a few reacting, well, that's called abnormal. But who in the world's going to say that what the majority are doing today is that normal? Is mankind really normal? And that, I think, would be a subject for quite a debate. And I think it would be very difficult to sustain the thesis that we are all normal. Remember when they sent Hamlet in the play of Shakespeare. According to Shakespeare, they sent him from Denmark over to England. And the reason they sent him over that because they thought Hamlet was a little touched in the head. And Shakespeare makes this statement, and of course that was to be played to an English audience, says we send him to England because they're all over there are abnormal. Well, that may apply to the entire human race. I heard this little story some time ago when I was down in Florida about a man that at night he felt like somebody was under his bed and he would get up and look under his bed, satisfy himself at that time that nobody was there. He'd get back in bed, and he wouldn't be there five minutes till again he'd feel like somebody's under his bed, and he'd have to get out look under his bed again. Well, he'd do that off and on all night. He's losing his sleep. And this man knew that that was abnormal, and so he decided he better go to a psychiatrist. And he went to a psychiatrist, and he told him his problem. And the psychiatrist says, well, you really do have a problem. And it's going to be very difficult to bring you back to normal. But he said, I think we can do it. All right. Now, he says it'll take 10 sessions, and it'll cost you $25 for each session. Well, the man says, I'll have to think that over, and I'll let you know. Well, he left, but he didn't come back. Several days went by. In fact, several weeks went by. And one day, the psychiatrist met this man on the street. And he said to him, he said, you were the man that had trouble with the man under your bed. And you would have come back to me, and you didn't come back. And I just wondered why you didn't. And this man says, well, says, I got cured. Well, he says, how did you get cured? Well, he says, I met a carpenter friend of mine, after I'd been to your place, I told him what my problem was, that there was somebody under my bed. And so I had to get out and look under that bed a dozen times at night. And he said to me, he said, well, I'll fix that for you. So he came over to my house with a saw, and he sawed off the legs on my bed. And he says, you know, now that fellow can't get under the bed. <laughs> May I say to you, I guess a lot of us today have some form of abnormality, you know. But this man, Nebuchadnezzar, he had a problem, and it was a bad problem. Now, first of all, he gives us his testimony, and I want you to listen to it here. And this could have been taken from the archives of Babylon. These are the things that you don't make public, you see. These are things you don't boast of. But here is his testimony. And then you find out why he gave the testimony and the reason back of it. I'm reading now chapter 4 of Daniel, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. 
how great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, friends, this is, I would take it, a marvelous testimony. And it shows development when you move down from chapter 3, and there he issued a decree. And here he gives a real testimony, and it reveals real development. Back in verse 29 of chapter 3, he made a decree at that time. And then he expressed a conviction. Now, here he gives a personal testimony. There it was a decree, and here it's a decision. There it was a conviction, and here it's a conversion. He sends a message of peace to all people, nations, and languages of his kingdom. He's not speaking of peace among nations, for he'd already attained such peace by military might, enforced by superior power. Rather, he speaks here of the peace of heart, which comes to a sinner when he knows that he's been accepted of God. It's peace with God. This man's tranquility was restored to him, and we're going to see this as we get into this book here. And he speaks of the fact that what he hath wrought toward me reveals that his testimony is very personal. God is no longer the God of only the three Hebrew children. He then testifies to God's signs, wonders, and dominion. He recognizes and acknowledges that God's rule is above him, and God's kingdom is above him. And friends, this is a peace that can only come to the human heart when he knows God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace that he made by the blood of the cross. That peace today that comes to a sinner's heart that all's right now because of the penalty that Christ paid and God now is for him and God is on his side. Of all of the trouble today and the travail that is in this world, troubled hearts, back of it all is the sin question. Things are not right. One young fellow said to me, I'm not at peace with myself. I'm not at peace with my parents. I'm not at peace with my teachers. I'm not at peace with anybody. And fundamentally... It has to be made peace with God. When there's peace in the human heart, then there can be peace made with those round about us. But until then, men do not know the peace. And I'm not sure today, but what a great deal of abnormality and what is called insanity today could be cured and certainly be helped by bringing the gospel, the knowledge of God to people. I thought how almost absurd it was. They set up these hospitals in the Philippine Islands when the POWs came home, you remember. And they were going to keep them there. They were going to examine them. They were going to give them psychological tests. And these fellows came bounding off of the plane wanting to get to the telephone to call a loved wife or mother or loved one and talked to them, and many of them said that God had been with them, they'd learned to pray, and Christ had been with them. And do you know who needed the psychological treatment and who needed the help? It was not these POWs, but it was those poor boys that were the psychiatrists and the doctors who thought these fellows needed a lot of their treatment. And today, people are being taught everything in the world in our schools and colleges, but they put the Word of God out, and there's no peace today. The Word of God can bring peace to the human heart, and that is the problem that this man here had. And when Nebuchadnezzar made his peace with God, and God had made peace with him, and God's already made peace with you, He's just waiting for you to make peace with him, you see. When that is settled, then, my friend, you don't need to spend so much time on the psychiatrist's couch. You find out that you've got a radiant Christian 
And I think that many of these fellows, when they got home and looked around them at our society today, they felt like it was a sick society and that we needed the help and they didn't need the help. And I wonder if some of them might have wondered what was it really they were fighting for over there. Was it to preserve our way of life? Was it to extend it to other people? Our godlessness today and our sin is a nation. What a picture you have. Now, we're going to talk about this man, and I want you to listen to him now because we're going to find out what his form of insanity is. And we find a symptom of it beginning with verse 4 of chapter 4 of Daniel. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. Now, already we find the personal pronoun my, I, and mine has already been used three times in this one verse. And you'll find it about three times in every verse now in this section here, beginning with verse 4 and going down to about verse 10. Now, listen to this. He had a bad case of perpendicular aetis. Remember, Job had that also. Listen to it. Verse 5, I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thought upon my bed and the visions upon my head trouble me. It's all about me and mine, you see. Now, I'm overemphasizing that personal pronoun now. Verse 6, Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and I told the dream to them, but they did not make known unto me its interpretation. Verse 8 now of chapter 4, Daniel. But at the last... Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the Spirit of the holy gods. And to him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master the magicians, because I know that the Spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretations of it. Now, let me say just a word today about this man's form of insanity. I'm of the opinion that the family had kept this quiet. I don't think much had been said about it. And I'm sure that those that were closest to him recognized it. I think that today that the psychiatrist would label it hysteria. Hysteria is a highly emotional mental disease. It's psychosis or psychotic rather than a structural form. It manifests itself in somnambulism, which is sleepwalking, amnesia, loss of memory, and it is thought to be hereditary. And it's quite interesting to note the number of world rulers that have suffered from this type of thing. And let me mention a few. Alexander the Great, he was an alcoholic, by the way, Antiochus Epiphanes, Epimenes, Caesar, Napoleon were subject to epileptic fits, Charles VI of France, Christian VII of Denmark, George III of England, Otho of Bavaria, and one branch of the royal family of Europe. It's been in the Spanish line, in the Russian line, among the czars. And you'll find it in the English line also. I found out that Henry VI, he was a real mad hatter. He suffered from something that was similar to hysteria. Hitler had this same type of thing. And the head of gold here... Nebuchadnezzar is a lunatic. He has bats in his belfry. He's not ruling with a full hand, I can tell you that. He doesn't have a full deck. This man here, he's just a little off, if you please. 
Now, it reveals itself, as we've already seen it manifested, in extreme emotionalism in any direction. And we'll find out that he will move either way. Now, the very key to this chapter is verse 17. Now, I want you to listen to this. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man, and he giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now listen to this. And setteth up over it the basest of man. Now God says that I put on the throne down here the basis of man. In other words, God gives us the kind of rulers we deserve down here and the kind that we want. And there's been many of them that's had bats in his belfry and he's been off his rocker. In fact, any man today, I would think, that runs for president ought to be given a thorough psychological test, see what's wrong with him. Well, why would a man want to do that? May I say to you, that God has said that he sets over it the basest of men. Now, God either meant that or he didn't mean it. He either said it or he didn't say it. But he did say it. And 2,500 years of history since Nebuchadnezzar has surely demonstrated it. And you study the rulers of this world, see if you don't come to the same conclusion. Now, this is the vision that this man has had. Nebuchadnezzar now is introducing the dream that he's had. Here at verse 10 of the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof. And all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Now, I break off the reading that verse 16. These verses contain the substance of the dream which centers about the tree. Now, the tree grew tall to heaven and wide enough to fill the earth. Now, the tree evidently was an evergreen, for its leaves were fair. It was a fruit tree, for the fruit was eaten by all. It fed the earth. Beasts stood in the shadow, and birds rested in its branches. And a tree in Scripture can represent a man. You remember in Psalm 1, 3, speaking of the blessed man, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And then a tree can represent a nation, as it does in Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, and Isaiah 56. We've already seen this. And Ezekiel 31. And the mustard tree in Matthew 
1 and 32 represents Christendom today. And the olive tree represents both Israel and the Gentiles. And you'll find that over in the 11th chapter of Romans, verses 16 through 24. And I'm not turning to that today, but I trust, though, by now many of you have our book on Daniel as well as our notes. And if you do, why, I have all these Scripture references there. But I'm not going to turn to them because I think it's quite evident, and we've been over all this ground before, that the tree can represent a man, it can represent a nation, and it represents Christendom, represents all of the Gentiles, can represent Israel. So that the tree here represents Nebuchadnezzar primarily and his kingdom of Babylon. The king and kingdom were inseparable. And the watcher and the holy one, they are an order of created intelligences that God has. The watchers are the holy ones who administer the affairs of this world. Maybe you didn't know that, but the book of Daniel is going to make it very clear that God has created intelligences that administer his universe. And this world that you and I live in, God has an administrator. And under him, there'll be many created intelligences. And over against that, why you find that Satan has his minions that also have charge of certain areas of the earth, certain nations. We're going to see that in the book of Daniel later on. I merely allude to it now. Now, these watchers, they see all, they hear all, and they tell all. You see, the very interesting thing is that many believers today think that they are living in secret, that they're not under the eye of God. But you and I, we talk about we want to enjoy our privacy. My friend, you and I haven't any privacy, if you really want to know the truth. We're told in Psalm 139, you couldn't get away from God. Wouldn't make any difference where you went. We're told that secret sin on earth is open scandal up yonder in heaven. They know all about you, friend. And if you're a Christian, got secret sin in your life, you better go to the Lord and get it straightened out because it's common gossip up in heaven. And so here, why these watchers are watching over it. Now, the tree was hewn down. And a band of iron and brass was put around the stump. They indicate it would grow and flourish again in seven years. And the heart of the ruler, or the tree, was to be changed into that of a beast. The vegetable was to become an animal in this dream here. And we have another dream that most men labor on today. They call it evolution, that The man started out as a little wiggle tail. In fact, now they think he's seaweed. And he started off like that. Vegetable became an animal. But, of course, that happens every day. It's quite interesting. The cow or the sheep goes out and eats the grass. And that grass is turned into meat. And you and I put it on the table. That is one we can afford to buy. Now, verses 17 and 18. And I'm reading now, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth over it the basis of man. Three things here that are the explanation of why God gave this to us. We ought to get the message. The first one is this, that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man. Now, if you feel that God has abdicated today and withdrawn from this universe, you are wrong. It's not loose from him. Emerson was wrong when he said, "...things are in the saddle and they ride mankind." There happens to be somebody else in the saddle, and he's in control of this earth. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Yet have I set my king 
upon my holy hill of Zion. That's in the second Psalm. God says that he's going on with his purpose in the world. Now, he's permitting Satan for a very definite reason to carry out a nefarious plot. Now, God is demonstrating something to his created intelligences today. And there are a lot of silly things being said about Satan today that are entirely unscriptural. We're going to get to that later on, too. Now, will you notice, I want to read here at verse 18 of chapter 4 of Daniel. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, now that's Daniel, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Now, you see, this was done for threefold reason. And I've only mentioned one of them. First, the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man. Nations rise and fall to teach men that God rules and overrules the kingdom of this world. And if you think that this nation you and I live happens to be his special little pet today, you're entirely wrong. We've already, I think, been put on the auction block and we're judged. And my friend, this entire splurge that we're taking, this downward course that we're on today, is going to take us to the judgment of God. He ruleth in the kingdom of man, friends. That's something we need to know today. Now, the second is this, "...and he giveth it to whomsoever he will." Now, you probably thought that the Democrats put their man in power, and you probably thought the Republicans did. (laughs) Well, they think they do, but God disposes of these kingdoms according to his will. And that may cause some chest to puff up, and they say, well, then I'm occupying this office by the will of God. A lot of kings in the past got that foolish notion also, that they were ruling in God's place. Don't believe a word of it. God puts them in power, and the third statement may be a little upsetting. But notice, Paul says in Romans 13, 1, the powers that be are ordained of God. Now, why in the world does God permit certain powers to rule on this earth? Why does he permit it? Well, the third statement is rather humbling to mankind, and it ought to be humbling to both the Democrats and Republicans and everybody else in this country, as well as everywhere. And he setteth up over it the basest of men. Now, you think that we pick the best man. We don't. God says he puts over it the basis of man. And you can take that for what it's worth, friends. It's in the Word of God. God's not going to withdraw that. And all you have to do is to read human history. I have been reading, as I've indicated, English history, and I've really been enjoying it. And I want to tell you this, that our ancestors came off those little islands called the British Isles. You know, we have some bloody ancestors. My, they were terrible. And I give you my word, they had some rulers there that were unspeakable. My, and the Battle of the Roses, that sounds so romantic. Oh, that was an orgy. That was a blood orgy. That was horrible. God setteth up over it the basis of man, and we get the kind of a ruler that we deserve. People complain about our government and our Congress and all that sort of thing. My friend, you put them up there. You voted for them. And God lets the basis of man come to power. That ought to be humbling for Washington. I like to see some of these men who are trying to curry favor with the great men of the world when they get a chance to speak at the presidential breakfast or be invited to speak in Washington they take this 17th verse as a text. He setteth over it the basis of man. And you can see now why they never invite me up there, friends, because, you see, I think it'd be a little upsetting to speak on this subject up there. 
Now, will you notice, history will substantiate this statement. And if you're honest and want to look at history, the head of gold was insane. That's going to be Nebuchadnezzar. He suffered from a form of insanity, yet a brilliant, brilliant ruler. He formed the first great world kingdom, first great world ruler. And he had times when he was as mad as a mad hatter, and he didn't even know who he was. Now, Alexander the Great was an alcoholic. Hitler was abnormal. Neither Mussolini nor Stalin would qualify as normal individuals. And the forefathers of our nation did not establish it as a kingdom because they believed that no man could be trusted to rule. And that is true. God's demonstrating it now over a period of time. He says, I set over it the basis of man. And you can believe that because God says it. Now Daniel's going to interpret the dream. Verse 19, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Now, actually, this to Daniel was a great shock and blow. Although he might have suspected something, but certainly now that Nebuchadnezzar is his friend, and he is the prime minister, the first dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, it dignified him. But this dream debases him. And it's so bad that Daniel is reluctant to reveal it to the king. And Daniel resists whatever temptation there may have been to withhold from Nebuchadnezzar the full story, for he now gives the entire account to the king. And by the way, that raises the question, should doctors give to their patients the truth in case of a fatal disease? Well, Daniel told all. And I believe that a doctor ought to tell his patient, I don't care who he is or what the circumstances are, what it is. If a man's getting ready to make the biggest step of his life, he ought to know it. That is, if somebody else knows it, the information should be given to him. Unfortunately, a great many people like for a doctor, you know, to more or less butter them up, make them feel good. And a great many people probably need a little psychological treatment. A doctor friend of mine told me, he says, I've given out more sugar pills than any other kind of pills. He had a clientele of rich women. And he said, about all they need is just to be encouraged a little that they're well. And they are sick, but only in their head, of course. May I say to you, friend, Daniel's going to lay it on the line. Now, he does use a great deal of tact, I think, in approaching the problem. He tells Nebuchadnezzar at first that the good in the dream is for the enemies of the king. Now, verse 20 of the fourth chapter of Daniel, and I'm reading, "...the tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair." and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown, and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Now the tree represents Nebuchadnezzar. He has grown strong, he's become great, and he's a world ruler, and he's filled a then civilized world. And his dominion here, and Nebuchadnezzar personally, that is the picture that is before us. Now, this is verse 23, chapter 4, Daniel. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, 
yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with the band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which is come upon my Lord. Now, you see, the tree represents Nebuchadnezzar. He is to be cut off, but not totally rejected. And for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar is to live with and like the beast of the fields, where he won't even recognize who he is. And I'm reading on now, verse 25 and 26, that they shall drive thee from man, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Now, he makes it clear here why this dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar and why he is interpreting it and why he's going to have this experience. This man, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up with pride, evidenced in the last chapter when he made this tremendous image and force all of mankind to fall down and worship him. This man is certainly filled with pride, and God now is going to humble him, and he's going to bring him out of the form of insanity that he has. Now, it's a functional form of insanity, and one that I say is common. There's a great deal of it today, of course, and we'll see how it is recognized he was to be driven out of his palace, out to the pasture, and he'll take his abode with the oxen, and he'll forget what manner of man he is. Now, this is obviously a form of abnormality that's diagnosed by psychology today as hysteria. And some of the symptoms which are evident in Nebuchadnezzar can be distinguished and they characterize this particular form of abnormality and the etiology of it. Many years ago, I studied abnormal psychology. Somebody asked me why to give it up, and I said I found out I had too many symptoms. You give up that study. And what you have in this, one of the symptoms is excessive emotionalism. You see, it's a sort of a manic, depressive psychosis. One moment the patient is joyful and friendly, and the next he's morose and antagonistic. It's a psychoneurosis. As someone has said, easy gloom, easy glow, and it's an up-and-down state. Now, many people have a slight form of it. You know people that they are moody at times, and another time they're very joyful and I think that's true probably of a great many of us. Now, this is a real thing, though. I mean, there's reality to it just because it is functional and not structural. It wasn't because of, you know, something that he wasn't dropped on his head when he was a baby that caused him to be this way. I heard the whimsical little story about the woman who lived in an apartment house in a city and in a very densely populated area. And she went to a psychiatrist, and he wanted to know what her problem was. And she said, well, you know, at night I hear a rooster crowing. It says, generally, it's toward the morning. She said, now, I was raised on the farm. I'd hear them there. But since I've lived in the city, I've never heard a rooster crow. And yet at night, I'm hearing it toward morning, and I know there must be something wrong because I live in an apartment house. She began to take the treatment because the psychiatrist told her, said, you really got a problem. And so he had worked with her for about a month or two, and she didn't seem to get any better. She's still hearing it 
One night, her apartment house caught on fire. Everybody in the apartment went out. The man that lived right above her, he came out carrying a great big cage and a cover over it. And he stood there by her side as they watched the fireman putting out the fire. Finally, to make conversation, she said to him, what do you have in that cage? And he lifted the cover on it, and there was a rooster in there. And she just fainted dead away. And they brought her to and asked her, why in the world looking at a rooster? Well, she says, I've been going to a psychiatrist for over a month because I've been hearing a rooster crow each morning. Well, I want to tell you, her disease was real. She really heard a rooster crow. Now, this man here, he doesn't know who he is. And this is quite real. Now, this is a form of abnormality that... As I've said before, great many of the rulers of the earth have had. God says he sets over it the basis of rulers. And the very interesting thing is, history has demonstrated that. And this man here is that type of a man. Now, another thing that characterizes it's always a form of amnesia enters in. When it's extreme case, there appears and the fellow doesn't know who he is. Well, that certainly characterized Nebuchadnezzar. I remember years ago when I was just a boy in Nashville, Tennessee, that's when that Nashville sound began. That hillbilly music was put out over the local radio station. And one of the announcers there periodically would disappear from the program and come back. He suffered apparently from this disease. He went out to a certain institution that dealt with abnormal people, and he spent time there because he could tell when this was coming on him, and during that period, he didn't know who he was, and he'd come out of it, and he'd come back. And I was asking another announcer down there one day, I had a little program on the station, a little devotional program of a morning. I asked him what was the matter with him and what caused him to have that, and he says, well, when you have to listen to that hillbilly music all day, he said, I have to do something for you. Well, I don't think really it was the music. And it may be. We saw last chapter that Nebuchadnezzar had to listen to a lot of it, the Babylonian Beatles. And that, I'm sure, maybe it turned him off. But anyway, there is another thing that identifies it. And that certainly is true in this man's case. And that is extreme egotism and pride, and it became an obsession with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we saw back from verses 4 through verse 10, he talks about I, I, I. He had a bad case of perpendicular I, Edith. Now, pride is one of the things that God says he hates, and it is something that certainly characterizes man. Old Augustus, Caesar Augustus said of a city that he captured, he says, I found it brick. I left it straw. He had destroyed it. And another Caesar made the statement that I found Rome wood, and I left it marble. You see, pride is the besetting sin of the human family. And after all, what does man have to be proud of? Jeremiah spoke of this in Jeremiah 9, 23. We've seen this before. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And you see, God's salvation rules out pride. That's one thing you can't have when you come to Christ for salvation. Paul could say, I determined not to know anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that today we have nothing in which we can glory. Again, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? And then in 2 Corinthians 10, 17, 
but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, God, as we've said, he says he hates pride, and it's number one on his hate parade, and you can check me on that in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. And it was said of our Lord, he humbled himself. Now, hysteria can manifest itself, as we've said, in amnesia. Those afflicted with this malady do not know who they are for a period of time. That's the reason that the old cliche about the man walking about the insane institution saying he's Napoleon. Well, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was an animal, and then this runs in cycles. Now, Nebuchadnezzar went through a cycle of seven years. Now, I'm reading verse 27, "...wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness." and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, and if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. You see, this man is disturbed within his own heart. There's no peace. He brought peace to the world because there's nobody to fight him at this particular time. And he was living in sin. And the thing you are to repent of your sins, turn from them, and turn to righteousness, turn to God and begin to demonstrate with your life by doing things that reveal your God's child. And so Daniel advises Nebuchadnezzar in light of this, therefore, to repent in order to reverse the judgment coming upon him. And there was hope of deliverance, you see. But you see, he could know the peace and tranquility of God. In other words, I think this was God's final warning to Nebuchadnezzar. And a great deal of abnormality today is actually a spiritual problem. Now, I don't say all is because I know it's not. When there is a structural basis, not just functional, of course. That is, if you were dropped on your head when you're a baby, and that may explain your conduct. And that, of course, hasn't anything maybe to do with whether it's spiritual or not. But a great deal of that is a great deal of the disturbed condition that men have today. It's abnormal, and there is peace for them. They would only come to Christ. Now we see the tragic fulfillment of this mental malady of Nebuchadnezzar. And here in verses 28 now through 33, will you notice it? All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spoke and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Now, this is an evidence that the king is on the verge of a break. He looks about this great kingdom. And God's already told him that he is the one who gave him that kingdom. But Nebuchadnezzar says now, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? And there have been multitude of men and women from that day and even before that, right down to the present hour, that have tried to build little empires. And they've looked upon them with pride. I mentioned the other day of a conversation with two young preachers, and they quizzed me about the program that I'd had here on the West Coast of going through the Bible and the number of people that had attended. And I said this to them. I said, look, fellas, don't try to build a little empire. I said, I started out with that in view. And I'll be honest with you, never have I been so disturbed. Never was I so unhappy. And then one day, and it just happened to be, it was at this particular passage of Scripture, we were going through it. And I said, well, I guess I'm an empire builder also, and I'm really not. My ministry is to build into the lives of people, not to try to build a great empire. So I forgot all about it. And I told him, I said, fellas, I can spare you a whole lot of sorrow and heartbreak and disappointment and disloyalty on the part of those that are supposed to support you. 
I said, start building in the lives of people, and I think then the Lord will let you have what he wants you to have. This man here now, he's plunged into this, and notice what happened to him. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it's spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from man, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man, and giveth it to whomsoever he will." The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from man. He did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like bird claws. Here is this man now that moves out of the palace, out yonder, to live with nature. And I have a notion, if you'd have talked to him at that time, you might not have discovered that he was abnormal. I think he'd have told you he's one of nature's children, and he was just going out and live with the animals because they were his brothers and sisters. And the very interesting thing is, somebody's going to say, well, is this historical? It's Albert Barnes in his book. He quotes Barassus, a Babylonian historian, who makes reference concerning a strange malady that was suffered by Nebuchadnezzar before his death. And I understand that there are recent findings that corroborate that statement, and Josephus is the one who is the authority for it. But it's been corroborated now by others. Now, this dream was fulfilled. Verses 34 and 35, "...at the end of days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven." Now his understanding comes back to him, and here's his brief testimony. Will you listen to it? He gave a testimony at the first. Now, this is to be added to it. I bless the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? You see, he's learned now God's running things, that God is in control of this universe. And he accepted this thing that had come to him as the will of God for him, and he yields his proud mind to the will of God. And that's what a great many actually believers need to do today, Now, will you listen to verses 36 and 37? At the same time, he says, My reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways, judgment, and those that walk in pride, he's able to abase. And so now Nebuchadnezzar's reason returned to him. His position as king of Babylon's restored to him. His officials surround him. The kingdom was not jeopardized by his long period of absence. And an added majesty came to him because he's come now to a knowledge of the living and the true God. My friend, this is a tremendous chapter in the Word of God.